everybody. I'm Karen Hartglass. You're listening to It's All About Food. I get excited a lot on this program. I've been doing it since 2009, and it amazes me how often I can get excited about talking to an author about something related to my favorite subject, food. And I discovered Christine Wong, my guest today, at an event with Dr. Michael Greger recently for his new book, which one was it? How Not To Something. How Not To Die. <laughs> How Not To Die. Maybe I didn't want to say that. How Not To Die. But he has a series of How Not To Diet and now How Not To Die. It's kind of a tongue in cheek kind of title. But moving on, I discovered Christine Wong and then I discovered that she had a new book coming out. It's going to be released in September. And I wanted to talk about it as soon as possible because I want everyone to pre-order this book. Now, for people that have followed me since 2009 or are recent to this podcast, I have talked about many cookbooks. In fact, this is audio only, but Christine, you can see behind me in the video <clears throat> numerous books. I have over 300 cookbooks, vegan cookbooks uh, from different authors, many I've interviewed. And... I don't like most of them because they're just not interesting to me. For someone that needs to know how to transition to a vegan diet, many of them are useful with simple, easy to make recipes. But I like cookbooks that tell stories, that give history, and really go into the details about every recipe with intelligence and beauty and art. And I have to say that this book that we are going to be talking about today, The Vibrant Hong Kong Table, is one of those. And it's going to be one of my favorites. And it's a very small list that I have of favorite cookbooks. So I am excited to talk to, uh, talk to you, Christine, today, to hear your story and to talk about some of your recipes. When I talk about a cookbook. I like to list some of the ones I want to talk to. And my list got very long. <laughs> so I hope we have even enough time to go through my list. But for Amazing. those of you who Thank don't you know so Christine, much. here's a brief bio. Christine Wong, author, plant-based cook, and advocate for eco-friendly choices, blends cultural representation with culinary expertise. Her upcoming book, The Vibrant Hong Kong Table, published by Chronicle Books, reimagines 88 iconic dishes preserving the rich cultural tapestry of Hong Kong. Christine's impactful work includes Living Without Plastic, co-authored with Plastic Oceans International, and The Plantiful Plate, showcasing versatile plant-forward recipes. Through collaborations with major brands and features in renowned publications, Christine shares recipes and tips promoting health and sustainability. An active member of NYC's Chinatown community, she celebrates Asian American culture on various platforms, embodying the belief that food is a vibrant blend of culture, nostalgia, and sustainable living. Thank you for joining me, Christine, today. I'm so excited to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me. So first, I want to talk about Hong Kong, maybe a little bit of your background, before we dive into your recipes. I happened to go to Hong Kong in 1995. It was kind of an interesting, bizarre trick for me. I was on a, it was a somewhat a business trip. The company I was consulting for was celebrating the Christmas holiday in Japan with their Jap Japan office. And so the, the big executives planned a trip to go through Hong Kong to Japan because a number of them wanted to have custom suits made. <laughs> it had nothing to do with the business. I think they were taking advantage of their expense accounts. And I was a partner of one of the people that was invited to go on this trip. And so I got to enjoy going to Hong Kong as well as Japan. And I really appreciated being there in 1995. Because yep. a major change was about to happen, which was the transfer from the British government to the Chinese government. 
And so much has happened since then, probably faster than most people in Hong Kong could ever imagine. So you're, you were born in Hawaii. I was. And you've lived in Hong Kong and in the United States. You have relatives everywhere. And this book, in addition to being a cookbook, is kind of a, a deep dive into your background. So can we talk a little bit about Hong Kong, Hong Kong today, Hong Kong to you and to your family a little bit? Yeah, Hong Kong has been home to my family for four generations. So a lot of it is being placed there was from escaping the Maoist regime and uh, and then, you know, my family going to all parts of the world was for, you know, for the handover and for also, you know, just everything, everything political, you know, like people just wanted to, you know, my family was fortunate to be able to be in a position to leave the country. Um, and so they they have left. And Hong Kong is still very much my home, despite the politics. It, it has changed a lot. And like you said, the handover makes a difference. Um, and it, it, it was amplified a lot quicker because there's supposed to be a 50 year uh, try, you know, like two systems, one country, two systems uh, in place. Uh, however, within the recent years, the, it, it has been very trying for H Hong Kongers to, because of their um, freedom. Their freedom has been kind of taken away, freedom of speech, freedom of just, you know, obviously you can't say anything bad about the government because, you know, that just is causes a lot of problems. And for me to see all of that happening overseas, it was one, it was kind of amazing to see everyone stand together in the beginning with like a million people protesting. Um, that was I wish I was there at the time, but now it's a time where it's you you can't do that. Like there's it's you're not you're not able to do that. But you know, I want to also see Hong Kong thrive and still be able to have know that their history is, you know, the, the where we can we were where we came from, because it is very unique having been a colony and and everything. Um and having had those rights and having our culture kind of bloom from these two, you know, our, our heritage and the, the uh, reigning government at the time. I want to say so many things. Right now, the <laughs> world is experiencing so many transitions sure. in, in the United States. And I mean, we just got big news yesterday. Uh, and, you know, uh, this is a podcast. I know people listen to it at different times. And so I don't want to date myself <laughs> by talking about current events. But yesterday, uh, President Biden backed away from his campaign and Kamala Harris is the projected Democratic candidate. We don't know yet, but uh, it's very exciting time. But there's transitions happening all over the world, and it's exciting and scary at the same time because we're seeing people that want to step back to a, a different time, which for those of us who are progressive, find that very scary because we want we don't want people to be exploited. We want people to have freedom of speech and rights and to live their lives as they want to. But what's fascinating is at the same time this impacts our food in so many ways and our recipes change when people move from one country to another they are influenced by the place they're in but also bring the influences of their past with them and that changes everything in very exciting ways so i'm glad you put this book together to kind of highlight that and hong kong is it was one of those special melting pots because many people come have come to Hong Kong from so many other places, and that makes it more diverse, more exciting, more open-minded. Uh, I remember, okay, I had a very brief time in Hong Kong. I was not in control of the trip. Had I had my own schedule and my own choices, 
and maybe the Happy Cow app, which I don't think existed at the time in 1995, I would have chosen different places to eat. And I remember being a little frustrated because we went to some popular places that the people I was traveling with wanted to go to. And it was difficult as a vegan to eat. And I, I remember getting these vegetable dishes. They were very oily. <laughs> And I was suspect, you know, is there chicken broth in this? I didn't know. And I was just polite. <laughs> um, but I love this cuisine and I love the food and the recipes that you've put in this book. I'm wondering, um, for me, I go to Manhattan's Chinatown and Flushing's Chinatown. In fact, we plan on going to a restaurant in Flushing's Chinatown this weekend with some friends. Um one of my favorites is the one on Mulberry Street, formerly the one on Mott Street. I'm not even sure if I pronounce it. Is it Bodhi or Bodhi? Perhaps one's you... Bodhi and one's Bodhi. One's oh, you mean Bodhi. it depends. One's, 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 well, no, because they're two different. They have very similar names. So one's Buddha Bodhi and one's yes. Buddha Bodhi. So it's very confusing because uh, everyone goes the to the different oh, And owned, which, and which different one is people. which? They're owned by different people. Um, yeah. I, I have to look it up. I don't remember. Okay, well, I one's on Mulberry it, and one's on Mott. So I used to, the first one was on Mott Street and I called it Buddha Bodai, but I don't know if that was correct. And then I heard there was some kind of tiff and yes. they split into two. And now I go to what I call Bodai Kosher Vegetarian on yes. Mulberry, but maybe it's Bodhi. Maybe. Maybe. And then the yeah, one in Flushing. <laughs> The one in Flushing, I think, originated, too, from the same owners, but it's moved many times and changed owners, and now it's Bodai, Bodhi Village. Don't know. <laughs> okay. It's, it's all good. But it, if you go outside of, I mean, it's still the same, whether it was in 1995 or now, if you go to a Chinese restaurant, you you it, it's slim pickings, you know, for a vegan, you know, and so partially that's the reason why I wrote the book too, because like you go to a restaurant and you order the eggplant, but there's pork in it and you, and they're like, it's vegetarian. I'm like, no, it's not, you yeah. know, because, but, but they, a lot of times in Chinese cuisine, they think that, you know, they believe that meat is just an ingredient. It's a flavor. It's a flavor profile to add to a dish, right? So you don't really need to have that pork in the, um, in the eggplant, like mushrooms are a great substitute. It's just about that texture profile. A lot of it, there's a lot of layering in flavors, but also textures. Um, so that's why they put it in, but totally not necessary. And so like writing this book, it was literally, I wish I could go to a restaurant and just eat the items that are in the book because it's not that hard to uh, adapt. Right. Well, hopefully your book will will be a, a foundation of education for some of them. <laughs> if they want to go that way, they can yours, use your book as reference. So when did you become vegan and why? Just so we have a little reference here. I became vegan, I guess it was around, I don't know, 10 years ago. Um, and just I just stopped feeling the need to eat meat. Actually, I didn't like it. Um, and then I took the course, the integrative nutrition course. Hmm. And that's when I really found that, um, you know, foods can not only heal you, they can also harm you. So I was on the harmful side and I was really more intrigued with the healing side of the way that, you know, what you eat every day can affect your well-being. Um, and so I started focusing more on plant-based and I started my Instagram was when I started this journey. And um, I feel that a lot of people need to know more about plant-based, you know, it's more than a salad. It's more than a smoothie. It's more than a soup, you know, like it's not just bunny food, you know, it's, it's something that could be so much more, but people don't give it the chance. Like even in Chinese restaurants, like some of the top most like, renowned chefs you know they have beautiful menus and they go all out because it's all about prestige to eat meat and the seafood mm. and the dishes they're so elaborate but then if you go there as a vegan or vegetarian and you ask for something you're basically going to get steamed rice and like 
fried vegetables, stir fried vegetables. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what they can do. But I feel that they should be able to, you know, use that talent, a culinary talent and make something that's just as amazing with vegetables because it has so much more off to to offer. So, so many times the, it's called something like Buddha's delight. Yep. The the mixed vegetables that you can get. Yeah. Non-vegetarian if, restaurant. Yep. If I have to eat another Buddhist delight, like <laughs> forget it. I, I can't. I can't. <laughs> yeah. And then you mentioned at the book, I think that your one of your grandmothers went vegetarian at some point when her husband died. And do you know why she did that? She was always Buddhist. She was always Buddhist. Ah. Uh, and so and so, but when my grandfather died, she she just uh, revoked um, eating meat and everything. So but you're her becoming... diet was very different because a lot of it was the, it was very like saucy, very heavily processed. It wasn't, it wasn't vibrant. Mm. <laughs> I do remember it being very, very brown what <laughs> she was eating. But then at the same time, like she would still, you know, knowing how much, you know, she, I loved her curry, her chicken curry. She would always still prepare that for me despite being vegan. Mm. So so was your family surprised when you became vegan or not? Because you had vegetarian in the family already. No, they just still don't really understand it, but it's okay. It's, <laughs> I, I, I don't make a big deal out of it. Like I don't, I don't go, you know, I don't say, okay, we have to eat at a vegan restaurant. I, I don't, mm. I just find something on the menu that I can eat, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I'm okay with that. Cause I, I do cook a lot too, you know, if I, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> okay. The last question I have before we dive into your book is your your last book, Living Without Plastic. So you obviously had some interest in the environment and sustainability. Did that happen before or after you became vegan? I think that might have my I think it might have happened at the same time. Um so you know, just because I, I remember seeing something about how, you know, by 2050, there's going to be more plastic in the sea than uh, than than fish, which is just totally disturbing. Um, and just kind of knowing that there's plastic in the foods that we eat, too, was just it's just very alarming. But it was through Instagram and the community that like I got very involved with the vegan community and connected with a lot of people that someone said, if you watch a plastic ocean, your heart will shatter in a million pieces. I'm like, I have to watch this movie (laughs) because I needed to know. And it was just before world ocean day and we were going to an ocean cleanup and I watched the movie and it was very, like, it was very, very eye opening to me. And, um, I, I knew it had to change, but it wasn't even like all the the parts about, you know, the the birds having plastic in their bellies and things like that. It was five minutes of the movie where basically the producer goes around to all these fast food restaurants and he says, I can't use plastic. Is there something that you can do for me? Like, can you like, you know, put it on a plate or can you do, you know, can you wrap it in paper or whatever? I was like, oh my gosh, that is so, what a good idea. Cause I always had my water bottle. I always had, you know, carry my bags around. Mm-hmm. Um, the ladies in Chinatown always thank me for being so eco-friendly, you know, for bringing my own bag and everything. And I was like, oh, I can take it to the next level. And then I knew that I wanted to do something with them. And they were like, oh, okay, you can just uh, do a screening or you can do, uh, you know, just just tell everybody about our our movie and, and things like that. And I was like, okay, I can do that. But I also have a skill that I can add to it. And so what I did is I, I called the uh, vegan community on Instagram and I said, can you, you want to put together an e-zine doing uh, recipes, vegan recipes, using no plastic for when you purchase your ingredients. Mm. And so we did that for three years and we raised money for Plastic Oceans and other, um, you know, uh, like, uh, what's the other ones? I forgot, a, a bunch of um, environmental organizations. And we did that. It was a global community that got together and, and, and made this uh, magazine happen. And yeah, that was really fun. And so after three years of doing that, we got connected with, um, we got connected, we got a book offer, uh, you know, and so we were like, oh, okay. 
-hmm. (laughs) Let's do it. And it was an incredible honor to do this with them, you know, to to do this book. And we were in anthropology. But the only problem with this book was that it was came out at the height of pandemic in 2019, when everyone's using 100 times more plastic than normal. Otherwise, it would have been really like a much bigger splash. (laughs) Well, when we finish this interview, I'm going to ask you for some links to some of these so I can share them, at least for me to check them out. And certainly for my listeners, if they're interested, because it sounds like a wealth of information. Yeah. I think you even mentioned in the book that you go to Chinatown and bring a, a stainless steel container or something for your tofu. I do. I have to do that. I do. It's great. It's great. Like, so there's at Fong On, like one of the oldest tofu shops um, in Chinatown, they're very happy to use your own container. Actually, a lot of Chinatown places are happy if you use your own container. Mm-hmm. And there's what I found recently found a, a shop on Bowery, a Vietnamese grocery store that sells bamboo shoots uh, loose. And so I bring them my container. They put they weigh it first to tear it, and then they and they fill it up, and then that's it. They just minus the weight of the uh, the container, and that's fine. And it just is one less piece of plastic that I need to deal with. This society is all about convenience, and we need to train the public to get used to doing these things. It's not that difficult. It just requires a little effort in the beginning, and then becomes a habit. Yeah, because we've gotten so used to plastic, which is so detrimental to everything. Yeah, I mean, I'm the way I shop is what I my I, the way that my grandmother used to shop, Mm -hmm. you know, in a time before plastic. So it's it's luckily, excuse me, luckily the Chinese shops are still the same, where you can buy in bulk and you know, but now they use plastic bags. But I bring paper bags or I bring whatever, and and they're they have they don't even blink an eye, and that's good. Thank you for that. And you're inspiring me. Okay. I've got a thousand recipes here I want to chat about. (laughs) So first I want to talk about, you mentioned the Chinese greeting, have you eaten yet? Or have you eaten rice yet? I love that. And there's just, that it's just so laden with history. Yeah, it was, it was post-war, you know, because during the war um, it was, a time of scarcity. And uh, I think after the war, everybody was just, it was a greeting to people to just make sure of their, you know, to check on their well being. And, and, you know, we've said it ever since everybody says that, like my, it's, it's a, it's a term of endearment. My grandmother would always say that to me every time, whether we were on the phone or whatever, she would always say, have you eaten yet? You know, and that's, uh, that was just not, not hi, how are you? But that's the way of just checking on somebody. Okay. I am a big tea drinker. And one of the first recipes is your five flower tea. I recently bought a big bag of chrysanthemum flowers because I had chrysanthemum tea at a, I forget, was it, maybe it was a Vietnamese restaurant in Los Altos, California, and I liked it. So I bought it and I got it organic and I got a pound bag and it's going to last me forever. Uh, But this contains chrysanthemum along with some other flowers I'm not that familiar with, Japanese honeysuckle, red cotton tree flower. Um, It sounds lovely. And there were, one of the things I didn't realize when I'm making chrysanthemum tea, maybe not the five flower tea, but I'm supposed to rinse it first before I brew it, the flowers. You should rinse it just because the way, you know, when it's dried out, it's drying out. It's, you know, there's a lot of, there could be dust or whatever. It's just better to rinse it first. Just really quickly. I wasn't doing that. It's okay. (laughs) Yeah, the five flower tea, it's very, very good for like during the, the heat, like when it's hot out, it's um, it's a cooling tea. Mm. And same with chrysanthemum on its own. The chrysanthemum tea tastes a little bit to me like artichokes. <laughs> what are the flavors of the other teas? Are they sweet or are they perfumey? The, when you brew them all together and when you brew them for such a long time, you don't really have the floral fragrance. It sounds much lovelier than it might taste because <laughs> like Chinese, they also, we also love it, it the bitterness. Like it, when you, mm. it, it 
sometimes right edible flowers are yeah. very bit of bitter yeah. right so you do get the bitterness but you you use rock sugar or uh, slab sugar to to kind of mellow it out and drink it and and enjoy it yeah uh, the tea is also very good for when you eat if you eat a lot of fried foods or you know like when you have it's called hot hot air or hot wind eat hay and it means that you know you have too much like hot energy in your body and and so it's a very good way to cool down your body and like give balance to your body certainly you have rice in a lot of your recipes and for many of us for a long time we only knew one kind of white rice and then the world of white rice opened up to different kinds sticky rice and jasmine rice and then we discovered that whole grain rice was perhaps a healthier option and we live in a global world so we have access to many things i am now eating um a combination i like to make a black red brown rice combination i really enjoy it and i was buying the forbidden black rice and i didn't know why it was called forbidden but now i do because i read your book <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was because it was only available to the emperor and uh but now it's not just for the emperor <laughs> well i like to know that i'm eating something that is not just forbidden, but also um, was for the special people, but it is expensive. So it still has, um, I mean, it's not something for the masses, unfortunately, yet, because some people wouldn't want to spend that much on it. But I realize that I tend to spend most of my money on healthy food and not on the latest trends and you know the best sneakers or fashionable clothing i put it to food yeah because that's important to me so i think it's worth it yeah yeah okay can we talk a little bit about msg for a moment it is connected in the western world's mind to chinese food as a flavoring sometimes negative negatively and you had a little bubble that talked about msg yeah, I mean, <clears throat> MSG is controversial, but it is also in like every single junky American snack. <laughs> I, it is. I, junky. And, but, but nobody says anything about that, you yeah. know, about that aspect of MSG. But it is it it is natural, and it's um it just it just enhances the flavor of of dishes. I mean, I don't personally use it because I don't feel like I I need to amplify any flavors in my dishes because I like to, you know, and also a lot of Chinese cooking is about fresh ingredients. And 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 so you want to let the ingredients stand out. You know, um I I'm a little bit indifferent about MSG, but mm. also I'm not anti-MSG. I wish I could remember, but I had talked about MSG a long time ago. And I did say that I when I was a child, and we would eat in a Chinese restaurant, which my family loved to do. I'm from a uh, Western European Jewish background, and that culture loves Chinese food. And um, I would get a pressure headache sometimes. And people told me it was because of the MSG. And then I learned that maybe it wasn't. Someone told me there was another additive that worked with the MSG that may cause a headache in some people. Unfortunately, I've forgotten the name of what that was, but I rarely get that anymore. And recently, maybe five years ago, I was in um, a vegan Asian restaurant in San Jose and I got that same pressure headache. And one of the servers, it was from not something that they made fresh. It was from a packet of miso soup or something. And it had a long list of chemical ingredients. So I don't know what it was, <laughs> but I mm. tend to stay away from artificial ingredients and I like fresh food and fresh ingredients. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Yeah, but they say also that MSG is not, it, it could be the salt, right? I mean, everyone adds so much sodium these days too. I get It could be just too much salt, right? Yeah. yeah, I get a lot of, I get headaches from too much salt. Yeah. 
Thank you so. for that. So <laughs> we need to be educated and we need to make most of the food at home and know what's in it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Next up. Um, oh, I had a question. I, I, there were so many delicious recipes, but then I have questions. So I'm going to ask some of my questions first. You have a soy milk recipe and I've made soy milk. And the question is to soak the soybeans or not. And I had learned from a cookbook by Miyoko Shinner not to soak the soybeans before because it gives it a very specific paint-like flavor. I don't know if you ever noticed that, but when I made it at home, I noticed that soaking it gave it or brought out this flavor and not soaking it didn't. I'm not sure what that is. She had a chemical reasoning for it, but you soak the beans and I, I don't know. I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know how you would grind it if you didn't soak the beans because you're just rehydrating the beans. Like any bean, you you need to right. rehydrate it in order to cook it. Um, so I, you know, I guess uh, that's that's interesting. So do you just grind it just without um, any liquid? I'm trying. I think so. Interesting. I have to remember and then cook it right away. Yeah. And then uh, filter it off. Interesting. I've yeah. never heard of that before. I, I'm sorry. I don't know. That's okay. <laughs> Everybody does their own thing. And uh, it's great to have different options, but I'm just curious about it. I, I was making soy milk for a while and I've gone back to buying it in the carton and it's more plastic and I'm sorry about that, but forgive me. <laughs> no judgment. <laughs> I get it. Okay. Um, I noted a number of recipes all around uh, around page 60. But um, before that is, I just want to mention, one of my favorite dishes is the turnip cake. And you have a recipe for it on page 45. I've made tried to make it twice. And oops, it, are you there? Yeah, you do. Yeah, okay. Sorry. I've tried to make it twice. And it's a, a lot of these recipes are labor intensive and that's what makes them wonderful uh but you have to use one of these uh bain-marie the french word for a, a water bath that you cook in and uh i think when i made it i just i should have used a smaller pan to to cook it in because it was really difficult to maneuver around but uh i love them but what um, happened did it was it too runny or yeah it was difficult to cook, to firm up. Um, mm. I just had a number of problems. It was a few years ago that I made it. And then I ended up, um, I ended up having to like bake it afterwards. I did all kinds of funny things just to get it. It still was yummy, mm. but it wasn't like I had at the restaurants. Yeah, so sometimes what happens if if the batter is too liquidy, you want to cook it off a little bit so that it just reaches mm. that point where it kind of thickens up a little bit just in your pot. You hit you you thicken it up first and then you put it into the tin or whatever you're um, steaming it in. Um, but yeah, I mean, you mentioned that it, things are labor intensive. They are Chinese food is so labor intensive, and you just wonder how why is it so cheap. You know, like to make mooncakes, to make a turnip cake, it's like three steps, They're like three processes, like three like cooking methods it, for this one dish. Um, and, and you just wonder why is this like so cheap? It, it just, it's mind boggling. And, and it does make you appreciate the food so much more. So why is it so cheap? <laughs> I, I, well, the ingredients are cheap, but they, I guess they don't count their labor because they have labor, but it is like, it, it takes yeah. time to make things. And yeah, I've, I've read some of my reviews already and, and, uh, and they go, this is not an easy book. I'm like, well, it's not, I'm, I'm being very true to the tradition. I'm not making shortcuts because there, there is no shortcut for this, you know, to, to wrap a dumpling, you know, yes, there are those, those dumpling makers, those automatic dumpling makers, but for yeah. the rest Record, do not work. So you need your hands and you need some patience. <laughs> uh, that's why I love a cookbook like yours, because preparing food, in my opinion, should be an art. 
it shouldn't be easy all the time. We should have a greater appreciation for our food and how to make it. And every step of the way where it comes from, cheap and quick does not equate to good, either good tasting or good for us. Mm. So That's valid. <laughs> Uh, okay, so you have a section where you talk about, um, I can't even uh, pr pronounce it, but um, I'm going to read it. Page 54, you have a little bubble out of colonial influence, affordability and local taste came. The quintessential Hong Kong style Anglo-Chinese cuisine, also known as soy sauce Western, which was commonly found in Bing suits or ice cafes and... Tang. Thank you, Cha Chan Tang, or tea restaurants. And in the 1960s, new and popular dishes, including Swiss wings, which do not originate from Switzerland, and borscht, first made in Shanghai by Russian emigres using local ingredients and adapted for Chinese taste. I loved reading when I saw borscht, I thought, oh my goodness, what could that possibly be? And it doesn't even have beets in it, which borscht is traditionally made with. But it looks like a wonderful recipe. Because China, we didn't have beets in China. So they, they use tomatoes instead. It's a tomato-based soup. And it's yeah. not, nothing like borscht. Nothing but, like so. borscht, but really good. And when I see recipes sometimes with some unknown ingredient and I read what it's like, and I look for a substitution of something familiar that I have. And and normally something wonderful comes out of it. All right, the set, the recipes I'm going to highlight. Scrambled egg sandwich. I love your version of the scrambled egg made with chickpea flour and tofu. And you use it in many subsequent dishes. I'm going to be making that. It just looks so good. Yeah, my my eggs actually in the dish in all of the book, they turned out really good. They t I had recipe testers who were like, oh my gosh, like, I don't, you know, it's, it feels like egg. You're not using any weird ingredients or anything yeah. like that. Um, and yeah, they turned out really good. And the, but the thing is about this book specifically, which I've never really tried to do in my own cooking at home for myself, but is that, you know, just kind of try and be true to the textures or visual of, of, um, an egg or a Chinese sausage or something like that. Um, a lot of it, it was like a science experiment in my in my kitchen, <laughs> because just trying to make sure to get that text, you know, the right textures and to make it work and stuff. Sure, but instead of a just egg product, which people can use for convenience if they want to, yours are made with real ingredients, real yeah. food. Yeah, yeah. I don't use any mock meat or anything in my recipes. Okay, the next recipe which looked surprisingly good was the macaroni soup with spam. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not, I've never been a spam eater. Spam <laughs> is a scary food, but this dish with made with tofu that is marinated just looks amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And it is tofu. It is a tofu steak at the end of the day, but it's uh tinged with a little beet juice so to make it that spam looking it looks like a great comfort dish <laughs> it is and that's yeah. another very it's a it's a it's a classic hong kong mashup okay the next one is corn soup i love corn soup i love the chinese versions of corn soup because corn it has a number of great properties that work so well in a soup. It, it gives a sweetness in a savory soup. It gives that starchy creaminess. It's just a great te texture. And you gave me a great idea when you're using fresh corn to use the cob in the broth. I've never oh, done that. Yeah, that's the best. So what I do, I used to teach... Um, meal prep classes and stuff and so at the every time we were preparing dishes there was a bag that we a bowl where we kept all the scraps right to make a broth sure and so like you know and people at the end of the day they were like end of the class they were like fighting over the scraps to make who would make the better broth <laughs> <laughs> but corn cobs are really they're great to add to any like to to any soup base so one of the things i like when i review a cookbook is is there, do I learn things? And 
this is one of the things I learned that I am super excited about. <clears throat> What's well, okay. corn season? <laughs> right? Now, I tend to only buy organic ingredients. It's really hard to find organic corn, but we do find it. And so now I have an extra benefit. I don't have to throw away the, the cobs. I can use them and get more. Oh, have you ever made them. have you ever made the corn corn silk tea? No. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like don't waste anything. You could use that you you just take the strands that cut off all the brown bits, obviously, and you just uh, steep it in hot water for like 10 minutes. Oh, that's brilliant. That's really it's really lovely. It's and a, what it's do I do with the corn husks themselves? I guess I could make um tamales. Tamales. <laughs> <laughs> that's another conversation okay then the last in that section was the mushroom a la king oh my goodness i was licking the page that just looked so so good with a cashew cream cashew cream is the best i mean i have so i have obviously not all my friends are vegan but whenever i make it they're like oh my gosh i need to make this they, yeah. they're just converted right there and then <laughs> now you you talked about your father and his cooking and in the culture during a certain period of time how canned foods were very popular with the corn soup and with the cream of mushroom soup using in recipes and your recipes of course bring it up several notches because you're using real food and artificial ingredients but getting some of that same comfort feeling in the recipes yeah, well, the canned food is all about you know it was all about cost, right? And sure. and and a lot of the recipes in the book or, or a lot of the recipes in Hong Kong cuisine are derived because the Western community, the expats, would be enjoying like high tea or you know and having dairy and things like that, where. The locals couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford to eat it. So what they did is they they found they had cheap ingredients like condensed milk or whatever in, to replace the dairy, and hence all these uh, you know this very unique cuisine, the soy sauce cuisine came about. So and it was it was from just affordability, you know, and and it still is because and and it's and stability too right like you mm -hmm. know the canned food is shelf stable and uh you're able to create something you know delicious out of out of um these these ingredients during the pandemic i stocked up on tons of canned food i was never much of a canned food person but i wanted to make sure i was ready for whatever unfortunately yeah. that whatever didn't happen but i got a lot of use out of the canned foods that I bought. Yeah. yeah. Uh, fresh rice noodles. You talk about what they are, how to make them, where to get them. Can you talk about them? Yeah. I mean, you, it, it's, it's so easy compared to making fresh like pasta. You know, you're, there's no kneading. There's none of that stuff. You, you're basically making a really thin batter and you steam it. In a in a tray, like a, a lightly oiled tray, or yeah, yeah, I think you have to do the oil on that one. Um, and, and you steam it, and then you just roll it up. And it, again, it's one of those things that is so simple, but it takes a while to make. Obviously, if you're going to feed four people, you need to be at your steamer, like steaming it for at least a half an hour, an hour, because <laughs> it, it takes like one or, one or two minutes for it to. Um, kind of cook through and harden not harden but uh, solidify one of your recipes dried fried mushroom noodles uses these fresh rice noodles and i always wondered when i was at one of the vegan chinese restaurants that i would like to go to i got a similar dish i think it used like a mock beef or something in it but i wondered how did they make this now i know <laughs> And I'm glad. Okay. Uh, the next is Lunar New Year dumplings. Everyone loves dumplings of all kinds. And these are stunning where you use beet juice for that beautiful red color. Yeah. I've never seen that. <laughs> I, I dye my dumplings all sorts of colors. 
if you've seen on my, I don't know if you've seen on my Instagram, I did a whole pride rainbow dumpling, oh. which took a really long time, but it was, I, it was worth it. Right. <laughs> I've seen green ones, but I haven't seen the other colors. Yeah. And why not? Because yeah. for most people, it takes time. Exactly. But it becomes an unforgettable experience. Yeah. Right. And speaking of art and color, I'm going to bring up the longevity buns of on page 97 of your book. These are stunning. So much art. They yeah. look like little peaches and you talk about the the special peach in history, but so beautiful. And all the detail on how to get the speckled color on the peach using a toothbrush. Yeah. Yeah, they're they are very traditional. Like we used to have them at family dinners all the time, and they're filled with a red bean paste. Um usually, so like again, it's one of those hidden ingredient things. So red bean paste, you would think there's no no animal product in it, but mm. oftentimes they make it with lard for that extra richness. So sometimes you just never know wh whether it will have animal product in it. So, uh, they, but they do, traditionally, they do make the peaches this way. I mean, the buns this way, uh, shaped like a peach. Just, just overwhelmingly beautiful. And <laughs> I, I was not aware of all of this culinary beauty in the Chinese cuisine. Yeah, they don't they they don't serve it anymore. Like I, I it's been a while since I I've seen them, but I did find them at the same place where I do get my rice noodle rolls when mm. I don't want to be slaving over the stove. Uh, <laughs> at at forty six Mott, they they have these uh, longevity buns. I haven't asked whether they're uh, used lard or not. Oh, Sometimes they okay. don't because I think lard is expensive. So um, I don't know. I, I okay. haven't asked them, we but will they have do to have find them. out about that. Yeah, in the frozen <laughs> section. And I was really excited to see them but because it's it's definitely so much a part of my childhood. Okay, the next thing, page 100 of your book, Dining Etiquette. So <laughs> much important information there that we need to know. And you answered a question that I wasn't sure of about when your teapot is empty, can you tilt the cover on the pot? Because I was raised that way when we would dine in a Chinese restaurant in New York. Um, but then some people told me it was impolite. And you say that it's okay to do that when you want a refill on your time, on your teapot. I mean, I don't know why it would be impolite because it, it just, it, cause then you're not interrupting the conversation that you're having with the, the people that you're dining with. And it's just, a, you know, the, in the same way that you kind of hand wave a, the check yeah. you know it, it, you're not you don't necessarily need to verbalize everything um i think these i i don't see it as being no it's brilliant and yeah. so i was happy to see it there yeah uh i have to say that my favorite of all dishes in this cuisine are the stir-fried chinese greens and you included it and you tell us how to make it Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> uh, I don't think most uh, Western European culture Americans tend to go towards the stir fried greens, um, but it's my favorite dish. And it's so it good is. for us. It's so, yeah, it's so simple. Um, and <laughs> I've seen, you know, I, I, I've, I do social media for a bunch of restaurants here in New York City and so I'm behind the scenes and I see how they do it too the the blanching and I, I don't necessarily blanch my vegetables but mm. they they always blanch it first and then they stir fry it you know and uh yeah it, it's 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 a staple you like you always have green vegetables with any any meal I like to go to these restaurants we've talked about before during the off hours just because I live in off schedule, <laughs> uh, but I'm frequently in them around three, four mm -hmm. o'clock. And yep. usually in the back, 
where there's a round table, you see some of the staff pre preparing the green vegetables and there's this giant mound of green vegetables. I just get off on it. <laughs> <laughs> I like to know how it all happens. Yeah, for sure. I was doing all the research about, you know, why is this a Hong Kong dish or why is this like, you know, what, what's, what's the significance with Hong Kong, you know, and, and that was really important for me in selecting these 88 recipes, which by the way, is a lucky number. <laughs> oh, okay. 88. I know it sounds random, but it's a very lucky number ah, in, in, that's in good to Chinese know. culture. <laughs> in 1988, I went vegan. So I'm going to take that as a lucky thing. <laughs> There you go. And also, I love recipes that connect to history and can and help us remember things, important things that happened in the past. There's a lot of that in religion, especially special holiday recipes. And the religion isn't important to me. I'm not a religious person, but remembering events through food. I love that. Okay, we're coming to the end. And I just wanted to acknowledge the photographs in this book. You talk about your close friend, William Furness. William, William photographed me. So I went to Hong Kong and he photographed me um, in, in these, because I knew what my chapters were and I knew I wanted to just, you know, be present in Hong Kong and to see Hong Kong. I, I, you know, during the pandemic, I was really concerned about not even ever being able to go back. And that was when I was, you know, and so I, and I was writing the book at the time too. And I, it was, it was all very stressful, you know? And so I, I, I was, I was fortunate to go back when um, they weren't doing the 21 day quarantine, you know, which was, I was, there's no way I'm good. I could do that. Mm. Although I could have gotten a lot of writing done in that time, <laughs> but I right. needed a kit. I would have needed a kitchen. Um, but no, William took pictures, the photographs of me. And then my friend, Jeremy um, has lives in Hong Kong and has this beautiful, beautiful collection of images of Hong Kong, which when I first saw his work, I was like, I knew I really wanted to have them in there because what I was trying to evoke was, um, I don't know if you know the movie In the Mood for Love. Mm, no, by Wong Kar Wai. So it's a very, very beautiful uh, movie set in the 1960s um, with a lot of like lighting and colors and moody um, cinematography. And I, 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 mine is not dark and moody, but it is mo it evokes that moodiness and the richness of of um, the culture. And Jeremy's photos were perfect to add to that. Um, and, and who did the food photos? Me. I did all the food photos. <laughs> I I normally take photos in daylight, but given the time constraint of, of actually getting all the photos done for my deadline, I was I did some uh, with artificial light. I don't know if you can tell the difference, but uh, yeah, so it was a mix. It was a mix. And and this was all done in in my bedroom on my desk because that was like a single source of light. I have a lot mm -hmm. of light in the kitchen area and in the living room area, but there was a single source of light from my window and that was like the perfect setup. So I would have to like cook it and then run to my bedroom and <laughs> like take the picture, do the setup and then, and then you know, and then eat it. I always love to talk about food photos and how they happen because people have no appreciation for how difficult it is because you have to make the food and then take the photo and get the light right and get it all right. There's time constraints and these recipes are complicated. It takes so much time to make them. So I'm not surprised that you were the one who took the photos because it added maybe a little bit of convenience because somebody didn't have to be waiting around to take the photos. You were right there to do it. Yeah, a lot. And I didn't know what my schedule was. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't get a photographer to, to do it. And I don't profess to be a food photographer. I am a graphic designer, so I do know like competition, composition and stuff, but hmm. like, like the technical aspects of, of a camera, I'm, you know, I'm. Now you succeeded. They're beautiful. Uh, okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, Christine, thank you so much for joining me today. I can't say enough how much I enjoyed reading your cookbook. I'm so excited about it. I want people to, to buy it. I want people to pre-order this book and get it. It needs to be out there. People need to learn about 
how to make these foods or how they are made if you appreciate eating them. And I felt like I went on a journey with you, with the pictures and the stories. I felt like I traveled and that was nice. Thank you. I'm so uh, glad. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. Well, all the best with your Thank release. You. And I hope to see you. And and um, if you're ever making a nice big vegan dinner for bunches of people, well, I'd like to am, be a taster. I have I have a lot of events coming up in uh, September. So oh, the good. book launches on September 10th. And I have I actually have an event, a sneak preview event on the 9th. So if you want to get your book like a day early, <laughs> yes. you can come. I'm doing a, a taste and talk at Pearl River Mart. Uh, but I have events all throughout the city in September. And then I'm going to be in California for uh, like 10 days in October, like late September, early October. And then I'll be in Hong Kong for like two weeks to as part of my book tour and so okay. there's lots of there's lots of taste opportunities to be had great all the best thank you again for joining me and it's all about food great thanks so Take much care. okay bye-bye bye. that was christine wong author of the vibrant hong kong table thanks for joining me for another episode of it's all about food your comments and questions can be sent to me at info at realmeals.org and visit me at responsibleeatingandliving.com. Everybody have a delicious week.